Welcome to Undercover Arts Live, where you can meet the artists, chefs, performers, and organizations who shape the culture of Southern Arizona. Saka strengthens the bonds between people, place, and purpose through collaborative, arts-driven experiences. You can support Saka by becoming a donating member at Saka.org. Art inspires. Culture unites. This is Undercover Arts Live. My name is Kevin Larkin, manager of the Catalyst Arts and Makerspace here in the Tucson Mall. And our guest today is Danell Hogan. Danell is the director of the Stamazing Project for the Pima County School Superintendent's Office. She has served as an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow for the U.S. Department of Energy in Washington, D.C. And prior to that, she was a physics teacher for nine years, including three right here at Tucson's Catalina Foothills High School. Danelle, how are you doing today? I'm just happy to be alive as usual. That's awesome. It looks like you're somewhere with lots of books and fun science things. Is that true? I'm in my office, and we won't look around too much because it's pretty messy, but I always say the messiest <laughs> office is an indicator of the person who's doing the most work, so we'll go with that. <laughs> I agree. I agree. You know, you got a lot to take care of. You got a lot of mess around. You can't spend all your time organizing. You got to come up with new ideas, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm so glad you could join us today on Undercover Arts Live. Um, you and this amazing project have been into Catalyst a whole lot of times, doing robot roundups, doing STEM education teacher workshops. Um, it's, it's just really fun when you guys are in here. And uh, I wanted to start off our conversation today just kind of talking about the intersection between art and science. So STEM education, for those that don't know, is stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And when you throw art into that equation, you have STEAM education, which is another term that's, that's often used by teachers. Um, I, I also want to uh, start off with a quote from American astronaut Mae Jemison that kind of talks about the intersection between science and art. Uh, she says, science provides an understanding of a universal experience. Arts are a universal understanding of a personal experience. They are both a part of us and a manifestation of the same thing. The arts and sciences are avatars of human creativity. So I'm curious, with all of your experience in teaching and art and science, what similarities do you see between the two? Well, I think both of them require a lot of creativity and uh, imagination. And that usually is kind of left out of uh, some of the ways that People can engage uh, students when it comes to teaching science, technology, engineering, and math. And so we're trying to infuse those ideas back into those subjects. I mean, this stuff should be really fun and exciting and interesting. And um, there's lots of ways to uh, integrate the arts into STEM. Uh, and so we're always looking for those connections for sure. Do you think it's a similar mindset, like in a creative moment or as an artist, when you have like a creative epiphany or as a scientist, like do you, do you find some similarities there as well? I think so. I mean, I think a lot of the innovations and new ideas that come in both happen when you're dreaming, you're daydreaming, you're making connections between things that normally wouldn't go together. You're um, using your experience to draw on, you're drawing on the experience of others that have come before you. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that uh, there's a lot of similarities between the two. And I don't That's think great. they're at odds with each other. You know, a lot of times people will put them at odds to each other. I think they are, are really complementary. Yeah, I mean, it, it, both of them take a lot of creative thinking. And like you just said, when you pair two things you might not have thought of that go together, that's oftentimes their breakthroughs come in science and art, which is Yeah, definitely. Which is pretty cool. One of our favorite activities is this uh, great lesson from Resource Area for Teaching called Design Inspirations. And you give uh, children, they pick two cards, one uh, that's like design a chair inspired by a lobster. And then it's called uh, force morphological connections. They have to try to put those two together and use some characteristics of the lobster to build this new chair and, and then share that with people. So those kinds of things can really lead to super creative, new, awesome innovations and ideas. That sounds like that chair might hurt a little bit, might bite you. <laughs> well, it depends you. on how it's designed. And certainly one of the criteria would be that it should be comfortable, I would hope. <laughs> right, right. So this amazing project leads a lot of different teacher workshops in Pima County. 
Uh, you have been a catalyst a lot of different times um, doing all sorts of different stuff. I'd just like to show a video of just some of the stuff we've captured uh, on film with what you all are up to. That was fun. Uh, I was, I've, I've had the privilege to experience uh, a few of those classes and workshops myself, just peeking in. What can a teacher expect from a amazing project workshop? Yeah, we really ruin teachers once they've come to one of our workshops because we spoil them. So uh, we try to make all of our workshops super hands-on and minds-on. Uh, we want the teachers to do what we want them to then engage their students with back in the classroom. So those hands-on experiences are critical. And then, as you know, one of the characteristics of what we do is that we give teachers the loot, all of the stuff that they need in order to go and do everything that we're showing them. And if we can't give them that stuff, then we're not going to show them how, what they could do with students because it's like torture. Look what you could do, but you'll never be able to get the stuff that you need. So just imagine how awesome it would be. So instead, we like to give uh, exactly what teachers need so they can engage all of their students as soon as they get back to the classroom. Uh, and we usually only charge them about 25 bucks to come, or maybe it's free depending on the sponsorship. And they'll walk away with 50 to a hundred dollars worth of equipment and supplies. Cool. And I mean, these are long workshops too. You got, you are there for most of the day, right? So 25 bucks for most of the day, you get to learn new skills in the classroom that you can share with your students. They're super fun and engaging activities. And we feed them breakfast and lunch too. Don't forget that. So, Ooh, bonus. <laughs> yeah, you gotta feed teachers too. That's a good thing. Right, right. That really that goes a long way. Free food goes a long way. Um, so, uh, just with your own career, um, you have worked with the Department of Energy. You have worked on something called K Gray Education, which um, is focusing on student awareness of their energy consumption. Is that correct? Yeah. So I was an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow, and uh, that took me to Washington, D.C. for a couple of years. And I worked at the U.S. Department of Energy on the Energy Literacy Project. And the focus of that was really to help to make uh, our citizenry science literate, in particular energy literate, uh, and that means helping them understand where their energy comes from, how they're using it, where they're using it, how they could save energy, all of those awesome issues. And so I usually say that I know more about energy education than anybody else in the world, but you should take that with a grain of salt because <laughs> I don't think a lot of people are vying for that title. Um, but yeah, I spent a lot of time in that arena uh, looking at how to engage people with uh, energy issues. That's so cool. I'm sure that's just inherent in your in your workshops as well. Just, I mean, there's so much magic and uh, improvements to be made in our energy system and just how we think about energy and even flicking off the lights, you know, once you understand that that comes from a some kind of coal burning somewhere that some not, a lot of times people don't make that connection. And once you get more aware of your energy consumption, um, you can start, you know, imagining solutions to some of the energy issues we're having. Absolutely. Um, okay, Danelle, let's get straight to the point. When did you first fall in love with science? <laughs> well, I grew up on a ranch in Southern Oregon. And so, you know, that lifestyle, that way of growing up just leads to lots of exploration and outdoor experiences with my siblings and cousins that just uh, really fosters curiosity and um experimentation and all kinds of fun stuff. Sometimes it, we would get in trouble for different things, but mostly it was fun and, and, and fairly safe. Uh, but I will say uh, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Crow, I went to a tiny little elementary school. It was just one teacher per grade, first through eighth grade. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, red schoolhouse with the bell tower. They even rang the bell to call us in from recess. 
Uh, but my first grade teacher, Mrs. Crow, she was incredible. Uh, and she really engaged us in ways that were super awesome. We would, she would put on uh, her astronaut suit and sh her space suit, and we would pretend we went to the moon or somewhere and talk about all the characteristics of the moon. Uh, she taught me a dinosaur song that I can still sing. I won't sing it here, but um, all those experiences. And um, I think that really was the beginning of me really loving science and and getting into, um, I didn't. I don't think I wanted to be a teacher at that point, but definitely my love of science, I think started formally there in, in, in first grade. And then in high school, I just took every single science class I could get my hands on. I think I missed human anatomy, but I think it was just because I couldn't fit it into my schedule. But we had some cool electives like animals of the Pacific Northwest and astronomy and all kinds of cool stuff. Oceanography one and two. We weren't too far from the coast, so we got to go on some field trips over to the Oregon coast, which is really beautiful. So yeah, I would say it started in first grade and then just grew from there. Oh, that's so cool. So, I mean, you, you got sparked from a teacher is what you're saying yeah. is when you were oh, definitely. in first grade. And I had some other phenomenal teachers along the way, but uh, Mrs. Crow was definitely the first one that really fostered my love of uh, science education. I also remember one time when our whole school got to sleep out on the football field for an overnight uh, camp out. And in the morning we had made a uh, plaster of Paris dinosaurs and there were archaeological dig sites beyond the tennis courts that we got to go out to. And as we were walking out past the tennis courts, uh, one of the um, community members had been buried out there and breathing through a hose or something and came up out of the ground, was in like a mummy costume and ran off into the woods. I'm not really sure how I wasn't mortified and, and uh, terrified and, and unable to sleep outside anymore after that. But it was a really cool experience. We thought it was pretty fun. <laughs> so that's the advantage of going to a really tiny little school in a great community is you have these really wild, awesome experiences that you might not get if you went to a, a bigger school that isn't out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it sounds like you have a little more freedom to uh, to get experimental in your, in your science. <laughs> Definitely. Well, that's great. Um, well, speaking of, you know, of being a student yourself at one point, um, and now that you had this long and distinguished career as an educator, uh, the generation of kids in school right now face some of the biggest challenges that uh, humans have ever known. I mean, there's climate change, there's disinformation campaigns, there's our own energy consumption. Um, beating Fortnite is one of the biggest challenges of our times, sure. which takes a lot of scientific skill. Uh, can you speak to the importance of science as a way to solve some of uh, our issues that the next generation is facing? Yeah, I mean, I think knowing how the world works and making sense of the world through the lens of science uh, and using technology and engineering and math to come up with some of these solutions that we need is critically important. Uh, you know, you're not going to figure out how to solve problems unless you understand the science behind how all of this stuff works. And we're always learning new things every day. There's still plenty of discoveries to be made. I think sometimes people think, oh, we've discovered everything, we know everything about how this works. Uh, I think right now in particular, that's um, apparent that that's not true. You know, there's still a lot that we have to learn and investigate. So yeah, I mean, understanding these uh, ideas and understanding, just being science literate is critically important to being an active citizen in the world. You know, like you just have to understand how these things work, how these systems are all connected together uh, and how we might be able to solve some of these really big global issues. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like, just as a word science, this also goes hand in hand with a method of thinking or a way of thinking, correct? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a definable mindset that you go through and it's, it's based on curiosity. Can you take us through like, what, what is the scientific method? How, what is this curiosity and how do you turn curiosity into science? Well, we're killing the scientific method. So, uh, you know, the new shift in science education is we used to have this list of like, here are the seven steps for how science is always done. And it turns out when you talk to scientists and engineers, like that's not actually how it usually works, right? You don't go, okay, I'm gonna start always here and go in this order. And so instead we're really focusing on science and engineering practices and helping students use those practices to make sense of the world. So those are things like still asking questions and communicating your results and analyzing data using mathematics and so on, but um, it's really kind of messy sometimes, right? Like you might start over here and then you decide you wanna change something and shift to this other practice that you're putting, um, putting to use. And so, yeah, we're really trying to help um, with that problem solving critical thinking side of how to make sense of the world 
And the way to do that is by honing these skills, these science and engineering practices, so that, again, you can critically analyze what somebody is telling you and then make sense of it. And, you know, students always say something like, well, why do I need to know this, right? Like teachers hear this a lot and maybe parents sometimes too. And um, my standard answer for that now is just imagine if I was going to tell you something like, all right, scoundrels, you've got to do everything I tell you to do. And if you don't do it, I'm going to take the sun away. And then you don't do what I tell you. So I say, all right, fine, I'm taking the sun away. And then I slowly make it disappear and it gets really dark and you get freaked out. And then I say, you better do what I do or, or, or do what I tell you or I, I'm going to keep the sun away forever. And you say, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. And I say, fine, I'll bring it back. And slowly it comes back, right? Now you and I know what just happened. It was just a solar eclipse. But if you didn't know that, if you didn't have an idea that, that the moon can sometimes get between the earth and the sun and block out the light, then you would be at my will to do whatever I want you to do because you don't understand how the world works. It's really like that for lots of other things as well. I mean, that's an extreme example and people think, oh, I'd never be fooled by that. But people are being fooled by other ideas similar to that all the time. So if somebody makes some kind of a claim and you don't know how the world works according to science, then you might be fooled by that or somebody might be able to um, get money out of you because they can fool you with some information that you should be more critical about. So all of those things are the reason why we want people to be more science literate and just not believe everything that they're told or that they see on the internet. Like think like, does that make sense? fact check it, look up the references, look up the sources. And, you know, I mean, there was one the other day that was saying the moon's going to make a smiley face on May 16th. And I, and I was even like, oh, this will be really cool. And then I was sharing it with somebody else. And I went to look up, I, I didn't have the link. So I Googled the link and then I found an article that said, oh, that's nonsense. It's not really happening. So then I said, oh, never mind. I was fooled as well. So it happens to even the best of us, but that's why, again, you when somebody says like, oh, something's going to happen or this is going to take place, it's nice to actually double check it before you pass it on to other people. Absolutely. And I think that that is one of the solutions to disinformation campaigns and just kind of um, all the rumors out there. You know, it's just like when you when you actually do some investigating and think critically that way, it can really help. And it sounds like, I mean, you don't have to go to you don't have to go to school to really do this. You can learn a lot of these methods simply by experience and just by training yourself to think a certain way, um, which largely when I see your workshops, that's what you're doing. You're, you're kind of connecting dots for people and applying a concept you um, would have not thought belong in a different category. And you just kind of combine the two and, and each, each perspective can learn from the other one. Um, I'm curious, as you uh, travel around the country and even the world doing STEM education, um, what does that look like? You're, te you're, you're, teaching the, you're teaching the teachers to teach their students, but you're also doing it through this way that's like so fun and engaging. So what you were just in Central America, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, we uh, were in Peru last August, and then we've been to Honduras a couple times. Uh, and then a few years ago, we were in Liberia, West Africa, doing some work with teachers. Uh, and then, of course, we do work here in southern Arizona and, and around the U.S. as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about having that range of experiences is um, some of the universal issues in education, no matter where you are. And one of them, although it is on a different scale, depending on where you're at, is just the fact that there isn't enough funding for the stuff you need to engage students. So we're always looking for STEM on the cheap solutions. This is one of our big things. Like if I'm gonna give teachers $50 worth of stuff, I wanna get the best value and give them as much as I possibly can. So we're constantly shopping at like the dollar stores and Walmart and places where we can get stuff super cheap so that we can give them loads of what they need in order to engage their students. And that is, again, we wanna make these activities accessible to anyone. So also if you're in Liberia, West Africa, or if you're in Honduras or Peru, um, can you do these activities or what would some modifications be to make them accessible to, to students anywhere? Right, right. So it's a lot about accessibility and just knowledge on how to use those resources, which seems like once you have all the all the stuff that you need to make, it just takes a little bit of imagination to, to do it. Yeah. And I mean, one of the challenges right now, right, with remote learning, uh, with the pandemic going on, is uh, equity and, and uh, access for students. So some of our students 
many of our students don't have access to the internet, so they can't watch these videos online. They can't do the online engagement that other students can. So in particular right now, this amazing project is focused on, can we find lessons that yes, you could engage students with online virtually, but you could also send them directions. You could print out the directions and, and other uh, information they would need, give that to students and let them engage in a way that is both equitable and accessible to them. So we have a few Bernoulli uh, demonstrations that we put uh, online where you, all you need is a strip of paper, a spoon, a couple of empty coffee mugs and an aluminum uh, can. And with those things, you can do all of these really cool uh, demonstrations. You can learn a little bit about Bernoulli's uh, principle. You can do an engineering design challenge to try to figure out how to make that aluminum can quieter when you're doing this trick because it gets really annoying after a while. So all of that to say, you know, we really right now are focused on trying to find these engaging experiences where students are still sciencing and engineering. So I'm making up this word sciencing because if they get to call it engineering, I feel like we get to verb science as well. So Absolutely. we want them sciencing and engineering at home. And there are plenty of opportunities for doing that. Yeah, so you're saying you don't even need access to the internet, you just need some instruction and then you're good to go. You can just kind of follow your curiosity and see it through, which you mentioned your online videos, um, which is amazing has uh, this amazing project YouTube channel um, has some really cool videos. I actually did a few of them the other day um, just to see what was going on, what you guys are up to. One of them was ant behavior and you just put a piece of white paper on the ground that ants were crawling around on and you drew circles with a Sharpie and the ants wouldn't leave that boundary. And you, there's three sections of the video. The first section um, showed, the, showed all the different circles that were drawn. And then the next section just said, pay attention what you just saw. So I was like, okay, I'll pay attention. And then it showed the same video again. And it said, what, what other observations did you learn? And so I, this, as this process repeated, and the more that you saw it, the more that, uh, the more that I observed and, and noticed the behavioral um, you know, the behavior of the ants in this crazy way that like humans were manipulating. Um, but I thought it was so interesting that the more I watched it, the more I noticed. And that's kind of at the root of some of your teachings is that just pay attention more and more and do it a couple times and then you'll start seeing. Yeah. I mean, our two favorite questions are what do you notice? And then what do you wonder? And that can take you on a tremendous number of adventures in science and engineering, right? So um, and that ant video actually came from a, a friend of mine, Robert Corbett from Discovery Education. And I saw the potential of it and I thought, oh my gosh, this is really cool. And it has me wondering about a, a ton of stuff as well. I was out in my neighborhood after I saw the video with my piece of paper drawing circles around ants, trying to try different things out. And my neighbors saw me and they were like, what's going on? So anyway, it uh, it definitely leads you to on, on some interesting adventures because you just want to know like, why are they doing that? And what uh, impacts how long they'll stay in there? And what about this? And what about that? And so that, what do you notice and what do you wonder is a constant theme in what we're doing. And one of the things that we've been working on recently is this PQRST series that we have some of these resources where um, we have journals to help students write down what are they noticing and what are they wondering. And then they can take that and we have another journal where they can essentially like mad lib a science experiment where it takes them through this process of what did you notice? What do you wonder? Now take one of those wonder questions that's testable and turn it into a, an experiment where you think about the independent dependent variables. You then pick one of the independent and dependent variables. You systematically test it. You you collect the data, you graph it, you make a claim based on the evidence and you provide some reasoning. You have a friend look at that and see if it makes sense to them. And then you keep wondering because at the end of a science experiment, you probably still have more questions about what might be happening and some other things that you might want to investigate. So, I mean, my dream is that students, instead of this, uh, you know, like nightmarish experience some parents and teachers have had with science fair projects and things like that, where it's like, okay, like, what are we going to do? My dream is that students have lots of these notice and wonder journals, and it's really more like, oh my gosh, I have so many great questions that we didn't get to answer in class or investigate. So now I'm gonna go through my journals and pick out my top five, and then I'm gonna have to eliminate and pick just one, only one that I get to investigate. And that's really how it should be, because there are things everywhere, if you will just pay attention, that would be super interesting to investigate and try to figure out how they work. Yeah, you'd probably go mad if you tried to investigate them all. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah, and and again, uh, you know, I used to say to my physics 
students. My job is to ruin you. Like I want to ruin the way that you look at the world uh, so that you'll never be able to see it the same again. You will always look at it through the lens of physics. Or in this case, you're always going to look at the world through the lens of science, technology, engineering, and math. And you're going to know that there is a way to test these wonderings that you have and make sense of the world around you. That's really inspiring. Thank you for sharing that, Danelle. S speaking of some of these experiments and wondering and knowing, uh, you have some activities that we're going to try out today, right? That people at home can try out as well? Yeah, people at home can definitely try them out as well. Okay, some of these are on your St. Amazing Project YouTube channel. I was thinking we could go over to the uh, Robotics and Engineering Lab where you are normally based in Catalyst, and then you can show me remotely, and uh, we'll see if we can find some, some magic in there. It sounds good. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Danelle, you're still there? Yes, I am still here. So this trick is actually called a binary number trick. And um, Kevin, I don't know your birthday. Do not tell me when it is. But do uh, think of the number just for the day that you were born, not the month and the year. Ignore that. Um, and tell me, yes or no, is the number for the day that you were born on this card? No. OK. Is it on this card? No, it's not. How about this one? No, it's not. This one? Yes, it is. Excellent. One more? Yes, it is. You were born on the 5th, is that right? Yeah. How'd you do that? Uh, well, again, some people might say magic, but I would say math. And so, uh, binary numbers, as you might know, are zeros and ones. And that's how computers talk back and forth to each other with zeros and ones, a whole bunch of them. Uh, and so when you look at the cards here and you're saying yes or no, I'm able to figure it out because with the first five places in binary, we can represent 32 different values, zero being one of them that would be pretty boring if you just said no, 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 no to all the cards. Um, and so I can figure out your number no matter what it is by using these cards. It's just a really cool binary number trick. Um, and so we can do my favorite number, and I'll show you then how it works. So for my favorite number, I would say, no, it's not on this card. Yes, it's on this card. No, it's not on this card. Yes, it's on this card. Yes, it's on this card. And so then all you have to do to get the number is for whatever cards the person said yes to, you take this top left-hand number and add those together. And so my favorite number is 8 plus 1, which is 9, plus 4, which is 13. And every single time, if you just take the yes cards that they say yes to and add up those numbers, you'll get their number every single time. And we even make this accessible to little kids so that if you can't add those numbers in your head, you can then take the yes cards and then go flip them over and count the dots on the back. So the one with the eight in the top left has eight dots on the back and one and four. And so then you can just count up all the dots and get the number as well. So we've even made it accessible to really little kids. So that's a fun math magic trick, but we have another one with the cards that you cut out. So you ready for that one? I'm ready. Okay. And just so people know, we also have those cards on our website. People can print them out and there's lots of other cool activities they can do with them. But this one, all you need, and I had you cut out earlier, 36 cards from a, some kind of a box that had printing on one side and cardboard on the other. Cereal boxes where that's from a Ziploc thing, I think mine comes from some kind of packaging. And so as long as it's cardboard on one side and print on the other, we just need 36 squares. And then I'm going to make this trick a little bit harder. I'm going to make you add a column on my side and then a row on the bottom. And I'm going to tell you which way to put these cards. So starting at the top right for you. Wait, so b before, before we get into that, you had me lay these down in a totally random order. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When you set out that five by five grid, I just said set out the 25 cards, the first 25 in a five by five grid, and you can just put them up or down however you want. And that's so I can flip one like this now and it, it wouldn't mess you up. Uh, you could flip one now, but but then <laughs> you're going to have to leave them for now. And then I'm going to let you flip one over after we get this setup done. And I'm going to be able to tell you which one it is. OK, so uh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it as it is now. And then you're just going to tell me which ones to add. I'm going to tell you which way to put the, the next column on the right. So starting at the top, okay. 
you're going to put another card next to that top row, and it's going to be cardboard side down. So print, print side up. Nope, print side up. <laughs> cardboard side down. <laughs> On the next one, you're going to do cardboard side up. Good. On the next one, you're going to do cardboard side up. On the next one, you're going to do cardboard side up. On the next one, you're going to do cardboard side up as well. And now we're going to start at the bottom left, and we're going to put another row in there. And so at the bottom left, we're going to do um, cardboard side down, print side up. Print side up. Okay, on the next one, we're going to do print side up. Print side up. On the next one, uh, cardboard side up. Cardboard side up. Next one, cardboard. Cardboard. Next one, print. Print, and oh no. Oh, I was missing one. I found it, though. <laughs> and the last one you're going to do is going to be uh, print side up. Print side up. Perfect. Okay, now I'm going to turn around so I can't see what you're doing, and you're going to take any one of those 36 cards, but only one of them, and you're going to flip it exactly over. And then I'm going to turn okay, back, so... and I'll be able to tell you which one it is. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, turn, do, turn one over. Okay. And so now I have to look carefully. Okay, and okay, so I know um, that if you start from the top row, put your finger on the top row, and then come towards uh, to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, and then go down, wait, you're go, go right there, mm -hmm. and then go down one, Two. Is that the card you flipped? That is the one. <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> so this is, is that... actually it, this really amazing, and it's actually a really cool computer science um, technique that real computers use to send data back and forth. So when you send a chunk of data, which would have been your twenty-five by twenty-five or your five by five grid, then we put yep. some extra data around it, some parity bits, so that we can. Uh, when the other computer receives that data, we can check it for errors. So we use that for error detection and correction. And so okay. receiving a bunch of zeros and ones in little chunks can check it and make sure that the data didn't get messed up as it was being transferred from one computer to another. Interesting. Super cool. So you, you basically used extra information to figure out which one was off. Yeah, yeah. And so the extra row and column that we put onto your data allowed me then to immediately pick out which card you had flipped over. And it's really simple to do. Uh, but what's even cooler is we can code a message in that five by five grid that you put down originally. So if instead of just randomly putting them down, I actually use what's called ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Exchange, I can send you a message. Um, and so I can show you how that works if you want to see it. I would love to see it. Okay, so I'm going to flip my camera around real quick. Okay. So I already have mine set up um, with the um, five by five grid, but mine is in a very specific order, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But we need to do the parity part where we put that extra column in a row, and I'll explain how I determine whether it should go cardboard side up or print side up. So first of all, we want the number of cardboard sides and print sides to be even in each row and each column. So do you see here how there's cardboard, 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 cardboard? There's four that are cardboard and one that's print side up. Yep. We need them both to be even numbers. So there's only one print side up. So this has to be print side up because now it's two, which is an even number. So that's perfect. In the next uh, row, we have four print. I need two cardboard, so that's going to go cardboard side up. Which way do you think the next one's going to go? Uh, cardboard side up. Perfect. How about the next one? We need a print. And the next one? Cardboard side up. Even numbers all the way. 
Awesome. And then now let's start at this first column over here. How are these going to go? Now in the columns, it has to be even. Or even, even columns. Yeah, so we will do a cardboard side up. Okay. Followed by another cardboard side up. Okay. And then we'll add a print square. Then a cardboard. What's next? Then, then we will add a print. And our last one is just going to be a cardboard. And that should make both the um, parity columns and rows correct. Otherwise, you've done something wrong. So if that one doesn't make it even this way and this way, then you should go back and check your work. <laughs> okay. Now, if I was to flip any one of these cards over, then it would make one row and one column odd, right? Right. And so why don't you turn away from the camera? I'll flip one over and we'll see if you can figure it out. Okay. I'm not looking. All right. So I'm going to flip one over. Wait, wait for it. Wait for it. Now turn around and tell me which letter row and which number column did I flip over? So look for the row and then look for the column and then tell me which letter and which row. And it should be odd, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is B3. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. It was this one right here that I flipped over. Now, we need to correct this because I actually have a message coded in my cards. So then you might be wondering, like, how the heck can she code a message? Well, I can code a message the same way that you, uh, that I was able to figure out your birthday number. So here's how it works. Uh, there is this code called the American uh, Standard Code for Information Interchange. And usually it's a seven bit system, but in this case, we can get it to work with just five um, zeros and ones. And so really when I put, and so you can see it's like zeros and ones for all the different letters. I can't tell if they're uppercase or lowercase with just five zeros and ones, but I can tell which letter it is. So when I put my grid out here, this original data, I actually did it to match uh, the ASCII letters. And so cardboard for me is a zero and print side is a one. And so this first letter is zero, one, zero, zero, zero. If I look up zero, one, zero, zero, zero on my list, it's H. And so I can go through and decode this word. The second one is zero, one, 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 and that's an O. The next one is one zero one zero zero that's an r this is one zero zero one one that's an s and the last one is zero zero one zero one that's an e and so it actually spells out horse that's so cool so you just you can code a message to anyone just by using some squares and zeros and ones yeah and if i wanted to send you a longer message i could send you multiple pictures of data just like this that have different messages in them. And if you want to get really crazy and code uh, punctuation marks and uppercase and lowercase, then instead of doing a five by five grid to begin with, you could do a seven by seven grid. And then you can code all kinds of uh, different characters, including numbers and letters and punctuation marks and all kinds of cool stuff. And then I don't know if you remember when we first had email, um, people used to draw pictures using the um, characters and the punctuation marks and stuff like that. It's yeah. called ASCII art. And um, the extension to this lesson is for students to do ASCII art and animation using the same idea. So uh, it's super cool, lots of fun. But this is how computers send messages back and forth to each other. And CSN Plugged had this parody trick where we just did, you flip over the card and you get to tell which one it is. But I was like, oh my gosh, but you could also send messages here. And for little kids, you can actually print out cards that have zeros and ones on opposite sides. So instead of being so abstract and saying cardboard is a zero and uh, the print side is a one, they can actually use zeros and ones so it's a little bit more concrete. Right. That's so cool. So, I mean, we just learned how a computer sends messages, uh, which makes sense that humans invented this method without computers. Then they just got computers to do it. Absolutely. Uh, would you like to see some more fun things that we have on our shelf? Yes. 
here's another cool project that comes from a website we love that's called Toys from Trash. And basically you can take a Gatorade bottle and turn it into a projectile popper. And so after you uh, cut this off, done a little bit of work, built this thing, and I just made some of these this morning with kids that were like preschool age and first grade, then you can pull down on the string and that hit the ceiling in my office. Uh, and so anyway, you could turn a, a Gatorade bottle into a cool toy, which is pretty awesome. So that's one of the stem on the cheap ideas that we really love. And also, uh, you know, we just love these ideas of reusing things that you might have in your recycling bin as well. Here's another one. This one is pretty cool. So this is called a rattle rider. And just recently we added the head on the top so that it looks really cool and interesting. Uh, and basically what we've done is we've put an electric toothbrush inside of this pool noodle. When you turn this on and take the markers off and put it on a piece of paper, it rattles around and draws for you. And so it's really awesome. And those vibrating toothbrushes you can get at the dollar store. So this little guy costs under $2 to make and is really totally fun to play around with. And uh, I also on last Friday, I did rattle riders with 20 preschool kids from Anna Kolb's preschool class at St. Mark's and they loved it. So we were able uh, with support from Community Share to get them all the supplies they needed. And then online we did the rattle rider and the um, projectile popper. And then we also made rockets out of the pool noodles. And this is a combination, you know, talking about creativity and imagination. We've made rockets like this out of pool noodles. We made them out of insulation, pipe insulation. Uh, and we looked at some other toys, but this is like a grand combination of all the best um, features of all of those different designs. And then you just stretch this thing and you can launch it, which is really cool. I just went all the way across my office. Uh, and so that's a really cool one. That, that uh, again, is this cool combination of different designs that we've seen and then just engineering it to make it better and more accessible. Like one of the designs required you to have cable ties which are pretty easy to get, but you might not just have lying around your house. Whereas rubber bands might be a little bit more common and you can certainly get more of them for uh, the same price. So that's a really cool project as well. And all the directions for how to do all these are on our website, obviously. And we're, we're get, still putting together videos to show you how to do it, but um, those are some really cool projects. And I think I have a couple other things over here. One that we showed recently is how to turn a slinky into a Star Wars sound machine. So if you take the slinky out uh, and you hold it at the top, so you know May the 4th was on Monday and we always say May the 4th be with you. Uh, <clears throat> so teachers celebrate Star Wars Day, obviously. Uh, so if you take a slinky like this and you hold just the top few rings and then you let it drop and you kind of, no, no, doesn't really sound like a Star Wars at all. But if you take the styrofoam cup and you tamp it down in there, then you take the first few rings and do the same thing that I just did. Totally sounds like Star Wars blasters. I refuse to do that for you because you actually have to try it yourself. It's so amazing. <laughs> oh man, I want to send you the slinky. <laughs> That's a tease. I refuse to do it because it, this is what we do as teachers. We torture you a little bit because I don't want to demonstrate everything. I really want you to try it out. And that first time that you hear it live and in person is just amazing. So get yourself a slinky. They're only three bucks at Walmart and uh, explore and have some fun. And notice and wonder there's a ton of experiments you can do with those. Um, and then lastly, you know, I just wanted to bring it back to some of the arts connections that we make. Um, one of the things that I'm really pa passionate about is teaching people the real primary colors. So the primary colors are not in any case red, yellow and blue. Uh, and most people don't learn the real primary colors until they get into a high school physics class, which is sad. Uh, so sad, in fact, that I've even written a picture book uh, with an intern of mine about this subject. Let me show you the book. We like to hack uh, different things. And so we make a little journal that uh, out of graph paper that we put together in a really interesting way that requires no tape and no staples. And so my picture book also goes together that way. So I have to assemble it before we can have a look at it. So we just have to fold this, put it through here in the middle, then open this up like this. And now I have my awesome picture book ready to go. And so again, the real primary colors are definitely not red, yellow, and blue. 
So if you were to ask me, a physicist, what are the primary colors? I would have to ask you, are you talking about light or paint? Light with color addition, the primary colors are red, green, and blue. And for paint, the primary colors, which we call color subtraction, the primary colors are cyan, yellow, and magenta. And so these are the real primary colors of paint, not red, yellow, and blue. And we really want people to teach this correctly. And there are some really awesome ways that you can do that. So starting with cyan, yellow, and magenta paint, you can have children uh, create a rainbow, all of the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, uh, and see that with those three starting colors, you can create all of these different colors that you can see. Also, if people don't believe that cyan, yellow, and magenta are the real primary colors of paint, just go to a store or look at what co colors of ink you put into a color printer or a color copier. They are, in fact, cyan, yellow, and magenta. So anybody that's been in graphic arts and printing will know that those are the real primary colors. That is just awesome. STEM on the cheap. Anyone can do this at home. You just need a couple of bucks and a trip to the dollar store. Let's head back to the Digital Media Lab. I learned a whole lot. Thank you, Danelle. Uh, it's almost like learning magic tricks, which brings me to a quote, I think, of yours, that in my world, there is no such thing as magic, only physics. That doesn't make the world less awesome, just more interesting. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is a, a, indeed like things look magical and, and they look really awesome. But again, uh, if you appreciate that there's probably some explanation behind it that's related to some science or some math, it doesn't make it less awesome. It doesn't make those tricks any less interesting. Um, it really does make it more interesting and a lot of fun to try to then figure out what else you can do. Thank you so much, Danelle, for coming on to Undercover Arts Live and sharing this amazing project with all of our viewers. People can find more on your YouTube channel and Facebook page. Also, hopefully you'll be back in Catalyst um, sometime in the near future. We don't know we when. We hope so. We love that beautiful space and we're ready to be back in it. Absolutely. Well, we can't wait to have you back. Thank you so much, Danelle. Thank you, Kevin. Bye.